Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie. So this week for my Game of Thrones bonus video, I'm going to talk all about the rise of ancient Valyria as well as the future of the Targaryens in the books. George R. R. Martin has just teased that after he's done writing A Song of Ice and Fire, he's going to do a book just about the Targaryens. Supposedly it's going to be called Fire and Blood. It would be a historical book about their family starting in ancient Valyria with the beginning of their house all the way up through Daenerys. We don't really know what her fate is going to be in the books, but if you read any of his short stories, I think that it'll read like those instead of the POV style like the Song of Ice and Fire novels. Just a real quick reminder, I know all you guys really like this, my weekly book giveaway for A World of Ice and Fire is still going on. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and leave a comment on this video. So just general spoiler warning for everything through Season 4 on the show as well as everything up to Book 4. That's pretty much where Season 5 starts, it's like right at the beginning of Book 4 with a few exceptions. So let's start with a breakdown on the rise of Valyria. World of Ice and Fire adds some nice context to what was previously discussed in all the regular novels. Cool fact, dragons at one time covered the planet. They weren't like a swarm of locusts or anything. Just imagine how as predators they flourished during a prehistoric period when geographical conditions were favorable and they were the apex predators. People know this because dragon bones have been found all over the world, not just in the warmer parts of Westeros and the eastern continent. Dragons are critical to the rise of ancient Valyria, but they predate the Valyrians by a long, long time. Valyrians, as we know, discovered them roosting in the 14 flames, the peninsula of volcanoes here at the south end of the eastern continent. This is the area that became the Valyrian Freehold. The Freehold took a long, long time to coalesce, even though the books make it sound like it was an overnight thing. Think of Valyrians learning to bond with the dragons like the Dothraki domestication of horses. It's not really the same thing. Dragons were never domesticated, but as close as you can get to domesticating dragons. As that started to happen, Valyrians became much more isolated culturally. If you had the world's greatest super weapons, you'd probably start acting a little xenophobic too. That's why over time, Valyrians started to look the way we think of them now, with the silver gold hair and the purple eyes. The show changed that. I mean, they didn't do the purple eyes. The producers just said that they didn't look good on camera, which is a little bit weird, but that's why Daenerys and Viserys didn't have them whenever we saw season one. Some of you may have noticed how some of the characters' hair colors have changed just a little bit since the pilot episode, too. Tyrion was the biggest change, I think. You know, he went from Lannister blonde to the really dirty mix that we saw in season four. It was only jarring the first time I saw it. I mean, by the time season four rolled around, you don't notice these changes quite so much. So, over time, Valyrians are mastering dragons with a combination of blood and fire magic, enchanted items like the dragon horns, and sorcery. There was all kinds of magic being practiced inside the Freehold. The show hasn't really addressed magic in great detail, but I do think by the time we get to season six and seven, they will. I just think that the more learned characters, like the more bookish characters, like Samuel, Tyrion, Varys, they'll probably be given a lot of that exposition. Jon Snow is totally awesome when it comes to brooding, but he is not quite the scholar that some of the other characters are. I would say one of my minor complaints of the book so far is that it has said nothing about how Valyrians actually tame dragons. I'm sure George R. R. Martin will totally explain that at some point. There's a lot of things he's probably just waiting to deal with. But the really important takeaway is that affinity for dragons became a genetic thing. It's tied to Valyrian's blood, which is why they practiced a lot of selective breeding. That by itself raises all kinds of issues like increased risk of negative genetic anomalies, but the Doom pretty much took care of all the sister wiving. It's one thing when one family like the Targaryens do it. When you have a whole culture doing it, it gets a little crazy. So one of the most critical periods in the expansion of the Valyrian Empire was its war with the Giscari Empire. Before Valyria expanded all over the Eastern continent, the Giscari were the greatest civilization. Right now, where we are on the show, you really only see their legacy in the architecture around Slaver's Bay. But as we spend more time in Marine during Season 5, we'll probably get a better look at some of the really cool buildings. The Pyramid and the Fighting Pits are only the beginning. The Valyrians had five really great battles with the Giscari. After the fifth one, the final one, they raised their land, plowed it with salt, so that the Giscari would never be able to grow crops again. That was pretty much the end of them. Then the Valyrians continued to expand unchecked. They learned one really important thing, though, from Giscari culture. Slavery. Remember, the Giscari were the ones that originated Slaver's Bay. The biggest reason that the Valyrians took slaves from all over their empire was because they needed people to mine the 14 flames. The 14 flames were a big ring of volcanoes, but they were also bringing up ore from the earth. So that's where they got all their precious metals, everything to build Valyrian steel, as well as gold, other precious minerals too. They just needed a lot of people to mine it. Really important thing about Valyrian culture, even though they seem a little tyrannical, they have a lot of dragons, very powerful, very fearsome, they were much more democratic than a lot of the other cultures. They weren't ruled by a single individual. Everyone that had a stake in the freehold 
as in shares like you'd have in a company had a vote but during really important periods sometimes they'd appoint a single decision maker sometimes they'd use political marriages to consolidate power but there were also a lot of other ways in relationships they developed with cities later in the expansion the valerians actually inspired the creation of the free cities as well as the migration to westeros you know people moving into your land fearsome you move away Cohor and Norvos, which are actually right here, were founded during religious schisms during the expansion. Old Volantis and Lys, right here, were actually originally created to be trading colonies set up by wealthy merchants who had purchased the right to rule as clients of the Valyrian Freehold, as opposed to subjects. So if you were really rich, you could buy the right to rule a city. As a result, they got to appoint their own leaders. The Valyrians wouldn't send in like an Archon on Dragonback or anything. In other cases, cities like Pentos and Lorath, which are actually right here, chose to pay tribute. So whenever the Valyrians came with their dragons, they were just allowed to retain their infrastructure, just as long as they kept paying tribute. One of the really special exceptions is Bravos, which was actually created as a secret city by a bunch of slaves. The story goes that the Valyrians had a couple slave ships sailing around the Summer Isles. The slaves revolted, took over, then to get as far away as possible, sailed all the way to the other side of the eastern continent, the northern side, and founded Bravos there. They were so afraid of the Freehold coming after them that they kept their city a secret for hundreds of years till after the doom. So the interesting thing is, is because they're slaves, they were taken from all over the place. So they all had different cultures, different gods. That's why Bravos has so many different temples. We are going to see some of the city in season five. I don't know how many episodes they're going to spend there, but here in the middle of town is where you can find the biggest temples. All different gods, all very cool. So when you look back on it, Bravos, the Free Cities, very important to the rise of Valyria, but also a big part of its legacy. I will spend more time talking about all those different cities, like the Free Cities, as well as Bravos and future bonus videos, so be sure to subscribe to get everything. Feel free to let me know if you want to talk about certain cities first, and I'll just put them higher on my list. But the rest of Valyria's history is a little more well known, like the Doom of Valyria was a giant cataclysm, like the eruption of Vesuvius on Pompeii. Think about it this way, Vesuvius was one volcano, the 14 flames were 14 volcanoes. So when they say doom, it was literally hell on earth. It's written that it only took a couple of hours for the entire Valyrian Empire to just crumble into dust. There are a lot of theories about what caused the doom. I just think it was a combination of the Valyrians overmining the volcanoes, there were geographical changes that were happening naturally, and I think there was some magic involved. Just a confluence of events that blew the shit out of the southern end of the continent up down here, and blew a giant cloud of dust into the air that killed all the dragons that were flying around. Tied up in all that was obviously the escape of the Targaryen family. We know all about that. Daenerys the Dreamer saw the vision. Aenar Targaryen took his family to Dragonstone, along with five dragons. The most interesting thing about that whole story is that only one dragon survived from the original five that they brought to Dragonstone. It's not explained why, but eventually more dragons were hatched. From there we get really tied up in Aegon's conquest as well as the rise of the Targaryen families so we can talk about that in another bonus video as well as dragons specifically. Let me know though what's your favorite thing about Valyrian history and do you think that any of the characters in current day are actually going to travel to where Valyria used to be? George R. Martin has confirmed that we're going to go there in flashbacks. He hasn't said anything about going there in present day though. Just more awesome things to look forward to. Speaking of which, congratulations to this week's book giveaway winner. Kalel Grease, you win a copy of World of Ice and Fire. Be sure to message me on my channel or Twitter or Facebook for details. The next book that I'll give away will just be whenever I post my next Game of Thrones bonus video, which will probably be in like 7-8 days. So I also have a big update on the Telltale Games Game of Thrones game. I know there's a lot of games in that sentence. Now we know that there will be 5 distinct playable characters all from the same house. They didn't confirm which house it is, but I think it's not going to be one of the main houses from the books of the TV show. I think it's going to be House Forrester. That would just fall in line with what they did with the Walking Dead game. They created Clementine and used characters that were not from the comics of the Walking Dead TV show. They also confirmed, this is really important, it's going to be out before the end of the year. We will be able to play it before 2015. Just plan on December. They haven't announced a specific date, but I'm thinking December sometime. I will totally be giving away copies whenever they release it, and I'll be doing some gameplay videos. I know I'm really excited for that. But in the meantime, you can click here to learn all about the city of Bravos, and you can click here to learn about some of the big changes Season 5 is making to the books. Thank you so much for watching, so let's all high five, and I will see you guys tomorrow.